Shemai Achoi Soiskos, Podlediad Consortium Knobat the Day. And a Podlediad Hun by the Hinklowed, a Trouble Day Third Duidara and Bob Math of Bethe Arisk. Hello and welcome to SCOS, the Central South Consortium podcast. In this podcast, we'll bring you the very latest discussions on all things education. Hello and welcome to another of the CSC Literacy Teams podcasts. Uh, My name is Gordon Bell and I'm the Primary Literacy Specialist at Central South. Today I'm joined by... Evan Richards and I am the Deputy Head Literacy Leader and Year 6 Teacher at Porthcawl Primary School. Hi Evan, thanks for joining us today. Um, Today Evan's joined me to discuss how research has informed his practice and his role as a literacy leader and through that helped to inform the provision and teaching of literacy that takes place at Porthcawl Primary School. As a starting point, Evan, and perhaps you could just talk a little bit about the approach to literacy you employ at Porthcawl. Yeah, so I've been at Porthcawl for nine years now, and during that nine years, we have taken a visual literacy approach and we've adapted it and uh, improved it over those years. So that approach involves getting a picture, a powerful image or a video, and linking all of our writing to that over um, the time we do the writing. And we do a five day writing process in key stage two and a 10 day writing process, which uh, means we have a consistent approach to how we uh, do our extended writing throughout the whole school. Okay, Where um, where did the decision to use this visual literacy approach come from then? Okay, so before I was in Porthcawl Primary, um, I worked in a school in London, which was on uh, Westminster Camden border. And we had 95% EAL in that school. So it was a very different school to Porthcawl Primary. But with the high EAL, um, the deputy head of the school, who was from Penturch, so I think all all of the great teachers everywhere are from Wales, um, went to a course from uh, Dylan William where he talked about the embedding formative assessment and she came back with all of these ideas she got from Dylan William about um, the clarifying, getting classroom discussion, about providing feedback to move the learners forward and getting the learners to take ownership of their writing and what she did was combine all of these um, ideas from Dylan William with the fact that we had pupils, um, lots of pupils with EAL, so we needed a kind of visual approach. And we combined those two together to make our own uh, visual literacy as a school um, in London. And it just had a massive impact in London. So when I came to Porthcawl Primary, um, I tried to see if we could in some way change it so it could also have an impact in Porthcawl Primary School. Um, what was the process like then of introducing it at Porthcawl Primary School? Because as you say, it's, it's a very different um, cohort of children you're dealing with there than something that's that's worked in London with 95% EAL. Then you come to Porthcawl, you presumably tell everybody, I've, I've done this before, it worked in this context, but may, maybe it's difficult, isn't it? It doesn't always work that you take something from one context, just transplant it, and it immediately works. Yeah, so I had I had a few advantages with coming and um, introducing it. The first advantage was um, just before I came, we had um, an Ofsted inspection and um, we were given excellent, or I think it's outstanding actually with Ofsted in every category, um, especially with our English. So I had that to kind of back up what I was bringing in. And also the fact that because I had quite a lot of experience with it, I was bringing in um, some of the resources with me and some of the ideas. And also the fact that, um, the staff at Porthcawl Primary, um, if they see something that works really well and has an impact, they, um, it definitely helps. So what we did is we followed um, the implementation guidance and we went through the four stages there of how to um, introduce something. So we started off with exploring. So we spent just the first term with me just bringing in picture books and showing the staff the images and just coming up with kind of the basic outline of what visual literacy should be like. And I also gave them the opportunity to come and see me doing it in class. From there, we started to prepare. So we took our time looking at how the visual literacy would look in our school and how it would be different to what I was doing in London. We then started to deliver. And by the end of the year, the whole school was then doing the visual literacy. And then we got to a point after the end of that first year where we looked to not only sustain what we were doing, but then improve on it year on year. And now, nine years later, what we're doing now with our visual literacy looks quite different to what we were doing in that first year, because as Porthcawl Primary and as the staff have kind of taken ownership of what they're doing, 
um, they've adapted it and changed it and improved it year on year. Okay, that's quite interesting there because what you what you're talking about there is sort of seeing something in in terms of school implementation of something like a new strategy or an innovation, but it's been very much like a process, hasn't it? Rather than like a one-off event, you've talked there about like the process coming through and as you say that that kind of like coaching and mentoring the that you've been able to give to staff as well as, ha as having that model. What about the impact on um, pupils then? Yeah, so that was one of the interesting things, because what, what we found in London is the reason we brought their visual literacy in was um, for the EAL pupils. But the surprising thing we found is actually it was having a massive knock on effect on not only the EAL pupils, but because we were giving pupils ownership of their writing and because pupils were so involved in the whole process and we were showing pupils what it took to be a really good writer, we found that we had a massive impact on our level five writers of taking that next step up and also of those borderline level four or five writers and boys. So it's kind of one of those approaches where, although it was designed for EAL, it's actually had a huge impact across the board with our pupils. And we found that um, the way we deliver it um, allows us to kind of target all different areas. So it's had a really big impact on all of our pupils in all areas. It's interesting you talk, talk about boys and I know you did like quite a lot of research didn't you into looking at what sort of works with boys why why do you think the visual literacy then has been particularly successful with boys? Um, I think one of the big challenges with getting boys to write is especially as they get a little bit older I think when it comes to writing you kind of have to put yourself out there and you kind of have to pour your, your heart out onto a piece of paper and then someone can come and kind of judge what you've written but I think the great thing with visual literacy is because um, we model and because we allow the pupils to develop their own success criteria and we show them exactly what we kind of expect and what we're looking for, um, it allows boys and all of the pupils to kind of put themselves out there with that safety net of knowing um, they know exactly what we're looking for, but also they've seen an example of what we're doing. So um, I think it just gives them that safety net of um, putting themselves out there, but knowing that they're going to be ticking a lot of the boxes of what we're looking for. And I know because I've, I've observed visual literacy within your school and I've, I've seen it work. Another very strong element to it, even within what might seem like quite like a, a, a quick process when you talk to it about your five day process and your 10 day process at foundation phases. But you do put a lot of emphasis, don't you, on speaking and listening in the build up to writing? Yeah, so um, one of the really important things, I think, is what, what you want, another thing, reason why I think this works so well with the boys is um, you need your pupils to be engaged and you need your pupils to be excited. And if you're engaged or excited about doing something, it just makes the writing so much easier. So on day one of the process, um, we think it's very important to um, get them engaged and do some kind of drama activity and do something exciting so that the pupils then have all of these ideas. And by speaking, it also means that those pupils who don't necessarily have all those ideas get the ideas off all of the other pupils. So we do that to get them motivated. We do that to get them engaged. And we do that because if you can say something, it makes it a lot easier then to write it down. So that day one drama activity is very important to get them writing. Okay. Um, you talked there about... Um the speaking and listening and the writing. I know that one of the elements that you really wanted to look at in terms of developing, you, you talked earlier about how this nine year process, you continue to develop it as, as it's gone along um, within the school. And I know you were looking at the reading element, particularly weren't you, in terms of um, comprehension? Yeah. And, and that, so, sort of, that, that led you down a particular path, didn't it? <laughs> in terms of research, what you looked at. <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, with the visual literacy, it, it was working really well and um, lots of what we were doing was very successful and we kind of got to a point where we, we could kind of stand still with what we're doing, but if you stand still in education, everyone else overtakes you. So we got to a point where we needed something else, but we wanted to make, we didn't want to make a massive change, we just wanted to find ways where we could make small changes that were going to then have big impacts. So one of the things we looked at was if we can improve the comprehension skills of our pupils, could that then lead to them actually improving their extended writing because they had a better understanding of what they were writing about? So we looked at the reading reconsidered approach of um, combining nonfiction with fiction 
so that we were kind of coming at the writing from two separate angles and seeing if that combination could actually improve what we were doing. Yeah. I think it's really interesting, that, um, this whole idea around comprehension, isn't it? And, and the fact that um, this, I suppose, this paradox or conundrum that we have, that in order for, for pupils to be able to comprehend and understand, they need to have some sort of prior knowledge, be it through either reading or background. Um, but then, the, but then the, the conundrum is then, in order to to get that prior knowledge, they have to read more. <laughs> so they so they still have to when they come to that um, reading, they have to be able to sort of understand that. And, that, and I think that that's really difficult. For, it's something that like um, that we've been looking at in terms of can you actually teach children specific comprehension skills as a skill, or do you have to bear in mind the background knowledge and the context in which you're delivering it? You know. Um, for example, um, you and I know we're both uh, keen footballers. Um, when 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 we're back out on that pitch, I'm sure we were to show our skills, Evan. But for example, you know, if, if you and I are, are reading um, a, a, a report of a football game and it talks about um, in the 90th minute, Zaha wriggled past his marker, chopped inside, and curled a shot into the top corner, because of the the knowledge that we have either through our experience, do I suppose um. It might be questionable whether you and I have ever actually done that <laughs> in actual real life. <laughs> but for our experience, perhaps of reading about doing it, we kind of understand the context of that, don't we? So we, we understand why the 90th minute is important because it's the end of the game. We understand what chopping inside means. We don't sort of get confused about what chop is. And that, that, that's, that's a really difficult um, thing there, that, that comprehension see, has to exist within some sort of knowledge basis, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I like the mention of Zaha. There. It, sh it shows what a good imagination you have. Zaha <laughs> in the top corner. Um, yeah. So I, I think one of the things with visual literacy is you do kind of you have um, a different kind of comprehension because one of the things with the visual literacy in EAL is because you're doing comprehension kind of through a picture you're kind of you you get to show the pupils comprehension skills without actually having to read so one of the benefits of it is you show them a quality picture and they're clarifying and they're predicting and they're asking questions about that picture so with the visual literacy you do get to kind of develop those skills without the actual reading but you're right then the, the issue then is to de really develop them you need to actually have the knowledge of the reading to combine so by doing the skills through an image, but then bringing in non-fiction text linked to the image, I think you can kind of combine those skills together. Was was that the sort of route you went down then from having sort of done the research into the reading reconsidered, um, the reading reconsidered elements that you were looking at? Yes, yeah, so, so yeah, like we said before, what we wanted, we wanted some kind of thing we could just add on. So what we didn't want to go through a whole new massive process we just wanted some kind of little tweaks and the reading and reconsidered um, approach just seemed like a real common sense approach and um, the inside the bullseye approach where um, you get a non-fiction text and you link it to what you're doing which then adds to the fact that um, at the, so the two add together so it's probably best to explain how we did it so we've we, we got a book called Rose Blanche which was linked to World War Two. And we've done Rose Blanche for years and years, and we've kind of taken it to a point where um, we've improved it year on year. And it's kind of, I don't want to say as good as it can get, but it works very, very well and is very successful. So we needed to do something kind of slightly outside of what we were doing in our literacy lessons to improve it. So the bullseye, inside the bullseye um, approach involves then getting non-fiction texts and linking it to actually what you were doing in your literacy lesson to then improve what you were doing in your literacy lesson, but what you were then doing in your uh, writing lessons was then having an impact on the reading as well. So um, we took a non-fiction text for our reciprocal reading activities and we used the opportunity at the moment where we have that extra time in the afternoon just to really look into um, uh, themes and um, topics linked to World War II, which we could then add to what we were doing with Rose Blanche. When you were doing that, can I ask you, which which approach did you use? So, so for example, in terms of develop using the nonfiction to kind of like develop that background knowledge and, and to help pupils absorb the information in the Rose Blanche book, did you introduce the nonfiction before the fiction, before Rose Blanche, or did did the children um, 
read some of Rose Blanche first and then you kind of fed the, the non-fiction in? Yeah, that's a really good question because we did think about what would be the best way round of doing it. And um, the way we did it, and it I, it worked really, really well, is we introduced the images first from Rose Blanche. So what we found is um, by introducing the images first, the pupils then had that emotional um, connection to the character and they kind of wanted to know more then so the first image we use of rose blanche is a picture of her stood in the squ village square of germany with all of the soldiers leaving um and when the pupils see that they naturally have lots and lots of questions about world war ii and they actually want to know more and they also start to identify with the character as well so when we then introduced the non-fiction text after they had um got inside that character's head I think it had a big impact because um, they all wanted to know more and they all um, had lots and lots of questions that they wanted answering. So I think doing it that way around had had a really big impact. Um, when you looked at the, the different reading and you've introduced the nonfiction, so you've sort of like you've, you've improved the, the pupils absorption of, of the material. What's the writing process then looking like for you? How do you how do you sort of like bring that into the writing so that the pupils can kind of use that knowledge and, and display it in their own writing? Yeah, so one of the most important things, if you, if you want pupils to write really well, um, is modelling. It's really, really important. So um, we show pupils models in a number of ways. So what we do, first of all, is um, we get pupils to write their own success criteria. And that's done through showing them lots of examples of good examples of what we want them to do. So it could be um, if they were doing a diary entry, it could be looking at diary entries from pupils from last year or others. But this time it was great because um, we used Anne Frank's diary as our model. So pupils got that extra model, but also a nonfiction text linked to outside. And it allowed us to um, for them to see a real life example of what happened. Um, so that really added to it. But we also write our own models as well. So um, what we did this time is um, we used um, Anne Frank as kind of our inspiration when we wrote our own model. So um, I think writing your own model um, allows you to put exactly the elements in that you want. And it allows you to um, really. So, for example, if you, if you want to, your pupils to um, use different aspects you can just put them all in there and you can point them out so we're very big on alan pete sentences for example so if we were doing a certain type of alan pete we would make sure they're in the model so having that model is really really important and then having the non-fiction to back that up i think really helps and what you're talking about there in terms of model it's interesting isn't it like the that ye education endowment foundation guidance that came out about um literacy in key stage two a number of years ago talking about having researched into the different um, approaches to to literacy teaching, what they would recommend, what, what they know has an impact. And that's one of, the, one of the things that they talk about, isn't it? The fact that actually providing models and all almost like having that process that you've got there of being able to sort of like think through the writing and think aloud with the pupils in order for them to then sort of put it in their own writing. Yeah, definitely. I, 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 well, I think when we first brought in visual literacy, one of the, the, one of the most difficult things I think for our staff to get their head around was actually um, writing their own models because um, they were used to using their own and actually as an adult sitting down and actually writing your own story or diary entry um, is kind of a strange thing to do but by doing it yourself I, I, I do think it does allow you to break that process down and it allows you to put in the parts exactly where you want kind of like a teaching sequence so when you actually go through that model um, out with a class you can then talk through here I did this or here I did that. Here's a good point to do this part. And it does allow you to really break down the model and look at the different parts and talk about how you did it. And I think it is, although it's a very strange concept at first to start doing all of your own models, once you start, it has a massive benefit. And then it allows you to do the shared writing together and it allows you to do all of these things that have a really, really big impact. And it also gets easier once you've uh, written a few models, you, you get quicker every single time. OK, I, th I think it's an interesting thing to do for any teacher, I suppose, to, to be looking at, as you say, that writing process yourself to kind of an understand what the what the process is as you're going through it yourself. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Did you did you keep the so the idea you've got the nonfiction and, the, and to support the Rose Blanche and the Anne Frank diary, did, did it did that? like to de develop in any other areas of your literacy 
um, provision that you do? So did it did, did kind of like just stay within the literary lessons or were there other opportunities that you used in your curriculum on that? Yeah, so at the moment we're, we're kind of in a kind of unique situation where um, we ha we've got a bit of freedom. So what we did in the afternoons is um, we, we linked it into a bit of World War Two. So um, normally we wouldn't be able to do that. Normally we would uh, link to our topic, but at the moment um, we, we linked it into World War Two and we got to look in really, really lots of detail. So when we did Anne Frank, we looked at lots of the language surrounding Anne Frank and we looked at um, how people were treated back in World War Two and how unfair it was. And we got to go really, really deep into all of this. And um, by doing that, it allowed the pupils to come at the and uh, come at Rose Blanchett from a completely different direction because they had so much empathy for the character and they had a really good understanding. But they also then started using um, sub subject specific vocabulary like persecution and things like that. So. It was a really good approach, and I think in the long run, even though um, we could we can do it at the moment, it would be about linking topics to what you're doing. So we do do World War Two as a topic, so it would be a very good thing to do, linking it all in together um, and having all of your writing and your topic linked together. At the end of the process, obviously, you, you know you've used Rose Blanche before, and as you say, it's been really successful. Did you did you feel that sort of like um, bringing this different approach to the reading of it? Did it have that impact that you wanted then in terms of the pupils writing? Um, yeah, it's, it, it definitely had um, had a big impact in the style in which they wrote, I think. I think um, normally when they do the diary entry, um, we have amazing writing every year, but I think the style slightly changed this year because what you were having is um, you were having bits for of of um, Anne Frank's diary appearing in the pupils writing and they were writing their diary kind of in the style of Anne Frank and you could see that people had read Anne Frank's diary and kind of got the idea about how to read a diary but also that um, the pupils had a lot more empathy for the character so normally when when we've done that part of Rose Blanche they only know Rose Blanche as a little girl who's uh, um, in the square waving a flag but because we had looked at Anne Frank, they had an understanding of what was to come for Rose Blanche. And actually, although um, this image was quite a positive image, they knew that it was at the start of World War II and it wasn't going to be positive soon. So they had a much better understanding of what they were actually writing about. And they could put all these things in their writing that shows that things aren't going to be great for Rose Blanche in the future. OK, what's the way forward now for you as a school then? Obviously, you, um, you've said you've done this within your class, within within something that, that you knew worked well. And it, it sounds like it's really helped to develop that unit of work and improve the pupils' work and their reading and their writing. What's the way forward for you now as a school then with this? Um, it's, it's something that we're going to look to implement as we move forward with. Um, so we've got all of our visual literacy texts. And what we now need to start doing is, I think, trying to link our visual literacy texts to topics. So, for example, a book we another book we do is Baby Brains. And normally when we do Baby Brains, which is a story about a baby going up into space, um, that would kind of be done in our literacy lessons. And then in the afternoon, we would do our topic and we would do something completely different. So we need to start looking into if we are doing um, Baby Brains in the morning, um, for our reciprocal reading text, we should be looking at like the moon conspiracy theory or Area 51, or we need to start looking at topics that are linked together um, and the pupils will enjoy looking at, but will then add to their writing. And I think we need to start then looking at, as we design a new curriculum and we move in the curriculum for Wales, we need to have these themes, but have the books in the morning linked to what we're doing in the afternoon and linked to our reciprocal reading, because by linking all of this together, you get so much more out of what you're doing. And what we want to do is maximise what we do in this time. And if we can, if our reciprocal reading sessions, which are only half an hour a day, we can actually get more out of them. It's a really good way of doing things. And if in turn, we can get more out of our literacy lessons because of what we're doing in reciprocal reading, it just makes sense for us. So that's the first, the first thing is to roll it out into year six and do it more. And then next year, it will be then to roll it out to the rest of the school. Okay, brilliant. That's, that sounds fantastic. It's been um, really interesting um, listening to you talk about this and, and the impact that it's had and the impact that the research that you've done 
as a literary leader has, has had upon the, the work within school. Um, thank you very much for your time today, Evan. That's been great. Um, really enjoyed this discussion and look forward to continuing our podcast and maybe we'll have you in another one. Yeah, fingers crossed. Thank you for having me. Dil Chamrando ar y Benod hon o Sgwrs. Cofiwch yn dilyn ar Twitter a Facebook, tan ysgrifio i'n sianel YouTube, a mi nhw yn cymunedau ar yn gwefan a darllen ein bulletin ysgolion athnosol am y newyddion diwyn araf. Thanks for listening to this episode of Sgwrs. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, join our online communities via our website and read our weekly school bulletin for the latest news. Hwyl y mytro. Bye for now.